Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our next panel, Reforming the Safety Net for the Next Recession. Uh, thank you all for attending. My name is Catherine Rampell. I'm a columnist for the Washington Post. And uh, I'd like to introduce our esteemed guests. So to my far right, your far left, Gabriel Chodoro Reich. Did I get that approximate? OK, thank you. The small victories, yes. Um, who is a professor at Harvard. He specializes in uh, macro, finance, labor, economics, uh, those sorts of issues. Um, previously had worked in the, on the, in the CEA, the Council of Economic Advisors in the Obama administration. Uh, that seems to be a theme amongst many of our panelists today. And uh, he, has, he received his PhD from Berkeley. And uh, next to me is Tracy Gordon, who is a senior fellow at the Urban Brookings Tax Policy Center. Uh, she focuses on state and local issues, tax issues, the kinds of trade-offs that states have to think about when they are figuring out how to budget and, um, and how much money they have available. She also served in the Council of Economic Advisors as an economist. <laughs> Um, and uh, has previously also served on the uh, DC Tax Revision Commission, um, was a senior fellow at Brookings, I believe, prior to that, uh, assistant professor at the Maryland School of Public Policy, et cetera. And Berkeley so, alum. And, and also Berkeley alum. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> OK. okay. Um, so the session today is, bill, is billed as um, you know, what, what will become of the social safety net? How, should, how can we improve the social safety net? in advance of the next recession. And I know what you're all thinking, we'll have a social safety net in advance of the next <laughs> recession. Um, but nonetheless, we are going to talk about the state of the social safety net today, what kinds of automatic stabilizers we have available, what we could, work, what we could expand, and what realistically um, we can be working toward given the political dynamics both here in DC as well as on the state level. So I wanted to start out by discussing the state of play today. Uh, you know, there were a number of changes that were made to the social safety net as a result of the Great Recession. And um, you know, some, of, some of these policies were part of the Recovery Act. Some of them were extended. There were other initiatives that were taken both at the state and local level and, and at the federal level. And Gabriel, I'm wondering if you could just walk us through what kinds of changes we saw in recent years um, and basically the health of a number of these programs today. Sure. Uh, so I put it into two main buckets. One were policies that started with the Recovery Act, uh, the Obama stimulus, and, and some of those have lasted. And then the other, of course, big one has to do with health care. So in terms of what started with the Recovery Act, and then some of this is going to uh, unwind at the state level as well, uh, there are some changes uh, that were temporary to eligibility for SNAP, for food stamps. Uh, there are changes, obviously, to uh, unemployment insurance. Those were ad hoc, the number of weeks someone could receive unemployment insurance for. There was also a kick up uh, in the uh, weekly benefit amount uh, during 2009. That has expired with the Recovery Act. Uh, after, and as, and Alan talked a little bit about this this morning, uh, as states had to really empty uh, their unemployment insurance trust funds in order to pay for the increases in UI take up, uh, a number of states cut the regular number of benefits uh, individuals could receive. So before 2009, across the US, every state, uh, someone who's unemployed uh, could receive up to 26 weeks of benefits if they had enough previous uh, earnings uh, to qualify for that. Uh, there are now eight states in which that maximum duration is lower. Uh, they range, I think it's as low as few as 13 weeks uh, to 25. Some of those are tied to the unemployment rate, others are not. So that's a sense in which there's been a little bit of a walk back uh, of the safety net. The other big area is healthcare. Uh, this is uh, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, so that did a couple of things. Uh, it made it easier for people who weren't receiving insurance through an employer uh, to be able to buy insurance on exchanges. Uh, it created a number of subsidies for these individuals to be able to acquire insurance. And it also incentivized states uh, to uh, increase their Medicaid eligibility. So those are all things uh, which, uh, in theory, uh, if we get into another recession, could help uh, provide an additional safety net. Now, of course, we've never had a recession with the Affordable Care Act in place. And at this point, it's not clear we will. Uh, but uh, uh, they certainly went in that direction. And Tracy, could you walk us through at the state level um, how
robust or frayed the social safety net is. I know that there are a number of states that have had issues with their um, unemployment insurance trust funds, for example. Right, right. So unemployment insurance trust funds are about a fifth of the level they were at prior to the recession. In the 13 big states that account for about 60 to 70 percent of total unemployment insurance um, beneficiaries account for much of that deficit. Um, they were loath to increase tax rates to restore those uh, trust funds, even though the Obama administration provided certain incentives to basically do uh, tax reform in unemployment to broaden the base, to expand um, the amount that you're raising taxes from, from these very low levels of $7,000 to higher levels. Um, and they, a lot of states just didn't take them up on that. And so you've got trust funds that are not where they should be, um, and some states that actually don't index benefits either, um, and some differences in terms of states' um, ability to increase taxes when they're already indexing or not. Um, states also, you know, themselves are still kind of coming through the ringer of the recession. So um, they re have regained their tax revenues um, uh, since um, from the peak from before the recession, but there's still about, about half of states where they have not regained their tax revenues uh, peak from pr prior to the recession. In some cases, that's self-inflicted damage. A lot of states have gone through a tax cutting um, experiment. Um, Kansas is the one that gets a lot of attention where they've basically done uh, an income uh, sales tax swap, so reduced income taxes in the hope that that would spur an economic renaissance and in some cases paid for that by increasing taxes on consumption which tend to hit people at the low end of the income distribution the hardest, um, those um, could also leave people more vulnerable in the case of a downturn. Um, given the fact that uh, we now, we are about to have a Republican in the White House, Republican, in Cong Republican control of Congress, both houses of Congress, uh, Gabriel, I'm wondering what aspects of the social safety net you expect that, um, the the new party the uh, the new leadership to be more sympathetic to preserving or even expanding given that there are certain ways in which the business community benefits from the existence of automatic stabilizers and, and other programs so the caveat to this is the one that Jared Bernstein offered this is pure speculation uh, and people should take any political prognostication with a grain of salt uh, at this point uh, but I think there are a couple things. Uh, one that will be interesting to watch is trade adjustment assistance. Mm -hmm. So this was an old policy. Uh, it was uh, part of uh, passing NAFTA uh, that uh, extended essentially special types of unemployment insurance benefits and retraining to people whose jobs were lost because of trade. That sounds like something that the Obama, uh, sorry, the Trump administration uh, might be interested in. Uh, uh, a second one, uh, uh, that sort of stretching a little bit uh, what we think of as a safe net, very related to the stuff Tracy just talked about, uh, is aid to state governments. Uh, there's not only a Trump administration and, and congressional Republican majorities, but now a number of Republican state governors. And uh, Republican state governors, I would expect, would be very uh, enthusiastic if there's a recession and their tax revenues fall about getting help uh, from the federal government. That's something that could be made more automatic. It could, uh, some of these uh, spendings, uh, re reimbursing states for spending on unemployment insurance, for spending on Medicaid, uh, which are, are joint federal state programs, could be indexed automatically uh, to uh, state unemployment rates in the same way that extended benefits for unemployment insurance are. Uh, that's something I would think uh, Republican governors uh, might be might be uh, very enthusiastic about. Tracy, do you want to? Yeah, do you want to? Yeah, I would be very skeptical that that would happen. They're saying in state and local government that a lot of um, people in state legislatures, for example, started out as mayors, and there's a saying that they forget that they were ever a mayor when they get to the state house door. And similarly, I think that a lot of um, Republicans at the national level might forget about their compatriots at the um, state and local level. There is this hesitation to provide a blank check to states, and we've seen that over and over again. The fact that it was such a big part of the Recovery Act, a lot of people don't realize that states basically touched half of every dollar that was spent through the Recovery Act, not necessarily in just discretionary state aid, but programs that went through the states because they had to, because states are the main engine of redistributive spending um, in this country. Um, so, you know, I think that was an anomaly, the fact that it was so big, and it was so big because of, I think, um, Peter Orzag said that they just didn't know how else to get so much money into the economy. Um, it was a challenge for the federal government to undertake that much spending that quickly. 
Um, so I would be surprised if state aid were a big part of it, although I think it was an effective part of it, as you mentioned in your question earlier. Um, I'm concerned about things going in the wrong direction, as some of the other speakers have alluded to. So block granting Medicaid, for example. Um, TANF was block granted in the 90s, and we saw that it actually it was not very responsive during the recession. So while unemployment was going up, and especially for single mothers, um, you did not see TANF um, caseloads increasing. Um, and part of that is that because it's a block grant now and there are these four purposes that states have to satisfy, they have to um, provide uh, assistance to needy families, they have to promote work, they have to promote uh, marriage and prevent out of wedlock birth. So those last two purposes, um, states can spend money pretty much any way that they want and that counts toward their maintenance of effort requirement um, which um, you know, reduces their obligations vis-a-vis -vis federal money uh, to get the federal block grant. So I think that um, it's a much worse targeted program now, um, and it's not responsive to the recession. Um, states spend something like a quarter of their money on actual cash assistance, and so I worry about block granting of other programs like Medicaid and SNAP, which has been proposed in the House Budget Committee before. But at the same time, a lot of the rhetoric um, that Republicans and conservatives um, have used to justify their support for block granting is that they think the state should be given more control right, that, that they want these kinds of decisions to be made at the state level. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's for them, if we take them at their word, it's not about just, you know, hurting the poor, right? Mm -hmm. It's about mm -hmm. saying, well, people at the state level um, have a, a much closer view of what the actual on the ground needs are. I think that's right. Um, as someone who studies state and local budgets, I believe that to be true. And I think that you know variation is the hallmark of state and local government. They know their populations. They know their geographies. They know their cost structures um, better than anyone in Washington does. Um, and that's partly why the fiscal aid during the Recovery Act was effective. I just think that there needs to be some bounds on that. So there was a proposal, for example, um, from the Hamilton Project um, to require that states spend 50% of um, funds on core services, so cash assistance and also child care, which helps people to go out and get jobs. Um, that was part of the Recovery Act. There was a fund, an emergency contingency fund, um, that encouraged states to um, spend more on benefits. And, and you could establish something like that as an ongoing, um, on an ongoing basis, sort of an automatic emergency fund um, to encourage um, spending on TANF. And particularly towards um, the low end of the income distribution, you could have a cutoff at, say, 150% of the federal poverty line was this uh, Hamilton proposal. Um, and just make sure that aid is getting to the people who need it most. Part of the, the, so there's sort of two issues with the block grant. Um, one is, are you allowing states to decide how they want the money to be spent? Are you putting less strings on how they spend it? And the second is what we'd call the intertemporal aspect. Is it the same amount every year, or does it vary with the cycle? And is it indexed to inflation? It, sure. Uh, yeah, so is it growing over time? Mm -hmm. uh, you, could, uh, you could take a block grant system and have it be the exact same amount of transfers over a 10-year period as something that's uh, indexed to, say, the cycle or, or the joint federal state program. And that wouldn't make any difference if uh, there would be no difference between those two types of policies if state legislatures were forward-looking and realized mm -hmm. that they have more money now, but they're going to face a recession in the future and the revenues are going to go down, and so they should save some of this block grant uh, for when revenues go down. So part of this question is do we think state legislatures and state governors uh, are going to be forward-looking in how they treat these funds. My sense is probably not, but mm -hmm. part of the, I think the, the point of this panel and this uh, uh, conference is to raise research questions. This is one where we don't have a, a huge amount uh, uh, that we know, mm -hmm. and it, it matters a lot to how we think about the right way to design uh, how these programs uh, get funded. I so, think it's a great oh, point. go on. Oh, I was just going to say, I think um, earlier there was um, some discussion about the spend out rate of the Recovery Act and how when it went away, you saw state and local governments really suffering and, uh, and job losses in particular. Um, but I think part of the issue there is the timing and the lag structure and the way that state budgeting works. So if you think about losses in the stock market, for example, in calendar year 2008, those first became apparent in April of 2009 as states saw their income taxes coming in. They were putting together their fiscal year 2010 budgets. Um, and so they probably had an incentive to go for the gimmicks and the quick fixes. Um, so it wasn't until fiscal year 11 that they were really dealing with the fallout. So I think a lot of the early research in this area sort of failed to get that right. Uh, when I asked earlier about what kinds of programs, safety net programs, automatic stabilizers, et cetera, that the business community might be in support of, actually where I was expect what I was expecting one of you to mention would be um, 
the portability of benefits. I mean, as much as the business community has vilified the Affordable Care Act, delinking um, health insurance from employment is actually a benefit to a number of employers. I mean, the CEO of Uber, for example, has been a, a, a big cheerleader, at, at least of that aspect of the ACA. I'm wondering if you see any, any momentum behind, um, uh, well, either businesses standing up for that aspect of the ACA or pushing for other kinds of benefits um, that could, again, be delinked from employment and that could effectively serve as a sort of social safety net for, for people who have lost their jobs. Either of you. <laughs> yeah. no. I, I think uh, it's certainly something that the CEO Uber uh, would be very <laughs> forefront of. Uh, I don't know how many other people, but when I get in an Uber or a Lyft car, I usually talk to the driver and ask him or her uh, what she's doing or why they're driving. And a number of them uh, tell me they're between jobs, and this is a way of paying some bills in the interim, and presumably the fact that they can also get uh, health insurance uh, uh, while they're doing so is a huge benefit. That's still a relatively small share of the uh, economy. Alan's back in the room, he's done some work on uh, uh, the size of uh, the share economy, uh, it's a relatively small uh, share overall. Um, so we'll see. I mean, the other sort of problem that came up uh, earlier, and it came up in, in Larry's remarks this morning, is, is you can't really just delink parts of the Affordable Care Act. They all do sort of go together like legs on a stool. And so uh, it's difficult to maintain the portability and the access uh, to insurance when you don't have the employer group pool uh, without then requiring a mandate and then providing subsidies and then you're back to uh, but what, what we about have. other kinds of benefits so I mean the, the Affordable Care Act I mean the Obamacare the branding of it is is highly toxic I get that um, but what about other kinds of, of traditional safety net programs including unemployment insurance for example that are linked to being a w2 employee um, or disability insurance um, other kinds of benefits like that I mean do you see could you imagine a world in which the business community is actually clamoring for um, different kinds of government programs that would delink those from employment and then relieve them of the burden, I guess, of paying for them as well, at least directly for their employees? I think we should be clamoring for such programs. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is a growing share of the economy. Uh, it may require a new classification of worker besides mm -hmm. just employee or contractor or independent worker. Uh, Guess businesses are going to be interested in programs which uh, make labor cheaper for them. Yeah. Uh, the earned income tax credit is one policy that many economists uh, are huge fans of. It's a very well-targeted uh, policy uh, to uh, increase uh, wages or, or overall income uh, for people at the lower end of the spectrum. It also acts as uh, partly as a subsidy uh, on labor for businesses who can pay uh, a worker $8 an hour, and that worker effectively takes home $10 an hour. Uh, so that might be a place uh, where there might be um, some room uh, to, uh, to expand benefits. But I think as the discussion in two panels ago talked about that you're with income inequality and the sort of interaction with these programs, with both the EITC and unemployment insurance, you're reaching into sort of a different part of the income distribution. You need to have a work history to qualify for unemployment insurance. and so. Um, you know, with, when TANF was AFDC and it was cash benefits, that was something that was just putting money in the pockets of people who needed it, um, who were at the lower end of the income distribution. Uh, one thing that, that I've sort of been thinking about recently that I've been a little bit puzzled by, it's sort of more of a political economy question, is uh, a lot of the kinds of policies that would be most likely to help Donald Trump's uh, voters transfer programs, for example, um, are part of the Democratic platform and have been rejected by these voters. Um, I, I have my own theories about why, you know, maybe it's because there's this fear that an expansion of government generosity would go to the wrong people, for example. Um, you know, uh, you want, if you're a white working class voter, you're worried about a more generous transfer program, primarily helping, you know, uh, the inner cities, whatever that's code for. I'm wondering how we think about marketing these kinds of policies. If we do, in fact, that they do, in fact, believe that these sorts of um, 
both pre-tax and post-tax safety net programs, whether it's the EITC or increasing the minimum wage or whatever, um, if we do think that they are helpful um, for stabilizing people's financial security, how do we think about talking to voters about these kinds of programs? So I think the insurance aspect is important. Um, when we were talking about state aid, um, you know, I was thinking that uh, there's this moral hazard problem, right? So basically, why should you help out a state where the governor has been running up a huge deficit and leaving them more vulnerable in the case of an economic downturn? And uh, I think earlier when we talked about TARP and other interventions, um, the case was made that that's a very hard sell politically. Um, but I remember the president getting up and basically saying, you know, when your neighbor's house is on fire, you don't quibble about whether he or she was smoking in bed, you know, that you need to put out the fire. And so I think that um, appealing to sort of the, the spillovers, if there is, um, you know, uh, an economic downturn that affects one region in the country more than another region in the country, uh, we all have an interest in sort of putting out that fire. And I think you could make a similar argument um, in terms of sort of social insurance and people um, that are hit by exogenous shocks or um, uh, globalization, automation, uh, those kinds of things. So it's, it's less about uh, giving a transfer payment and more about insuring against risk, yeah. in other words? I think it's a great question. I, I, mean, I think it's going to be really interesting to see what happens if there's a movement to, say, privatize Medicare uh, and how people react to that and, and how that maybe echoes uh, uh, what happened with Social Security a, a decade ago. Uh, also, I mean, it, I don't know the extent to which these programs are, are seen to be popular. It, it is helpful to put some numbers on how big they are and what they right. can do. Uh, so maybe we'll talk about this. I I'm, I'm, tend to be a little bit skeptical that we're going to get that much stimulus out of uh, raising social safety net uh, eligibility and, and making automatic stabilizers larger. Uh, but there's no question that they are a very important part of uh, uh, keeping household incomes up. So for example, in 2000, in the Great Recession, uh, GDP, quarterly real GDP per capita fell about 6%, peak to trough. Uh, disposable personal income, so that means income after tax uh, of families, uh, stayed basically flat through the recession. And it stayed basically flat uh, mechanically because of things the Recovery Act did. If the Recovery Act didn't, uh, have the transfers in place and the unemployment insurance and the SNAP uh, and the tax cuts, uh, disposable income would have fallen about 3%. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a large uh, amount of income replacement uh, that these programs are doing. And another important point is that I did some work with Gary Burtless when I was at Brookings about this. Consumption didn't stay flat, but it stayed pretty high considering the hit that people took to their private income. One of the questions to come out of the Recovery Act is that it clearly federal money being transferred to the states help stabilize things. Um, and the question going forward is, how do we think about paying for social safety net services? Is, is this a good mechanism that we want to continue? I mean, given that states obviously often have balanced budget requirements, they can't do deficit spending, but if we do have um, this sort of, if we, if we do agree that it's, it's helpful to have this sort of flow of uh, funds from the federal government to the states, who decides what the triggers are? Right? Who decides when we should flip the switch, and, and are, is there sort of a moral hazard there? So the, the way that it worked in the Recovery Act, using the existing pipes, um, using Medicaid and Title I and uh, education worked pretty well because those programs were geared, tilted toward places that were lower income and that were already getting more money from the federal government. So just an across the board increase in the federal matching rate for Medicaid um, was pretty effective. And um, the great thing as you and other people have written about, as I've written about, is that it could be immediate. So the, the checks went out uh, March 1st of 2009 and were retroactive to six months earlier. So that was a big chunk of change that went to states very quickly. Um, the key, as you said, is the trigger, figuring out you know, what should turn on um, that money. Um, some researchers have played with different kinds of formulas having to do with swings in unemployment, um, swings in the Philadelphia coincident indicators, um, looking at tax revenues, but then saying that's actually a very bad measure because governors can manipulate tax revenues, they can manipulate budget deficits. You want to find something that is not subject to their control, but that is a true indicator of something that hit them. Um, one of my sort of pet ideas is to actually look at some regional measure or even like a neighboring state or synthetic cohort because 
that's also arguably beyond their control. So I think there are ways that you could design it um, and so that it's also equitable so that places that are hit by the same type of shock get the same type of assistance or places that have a bigger shock get more assistance. Um, again, I think it's just getting it through Congress um, and as I think someone said earlier, basically saying, you know, because we don't trust you or perhaps you might not trust yourselves to do the right thing in a case of a downturn, we want you to basically abdicate some of your discretion now. I think that's a hard sell, especially when um, you're, you're basically giving funds to the states and um, you know helping them out of something that you think maybe they should have been better prepared for. Do you want to weigh in? Yeah, I agree with all of that. Uh, I mean, the, the thing we all three of us have mentioned now that I can all just echo a call for research on is, uh, is this moral hazard problem? Our state budgets and, and legislatures can respond. My sense is they're not the most forward-looking agents, uh, but maybe they will, and this is something we ought to uh, look into. Uh, since triggers came up, uh, it's worth mentioning, so, so the uh, program that's most uh, well associated with, with triggers is uh, unemployment insurance. Uh, there's both ad hoc programs, but extended benefits, which is a permanent program uh, that allows states uh, to receive past 26 weeks of benefits. Uh, it's usually 50-50 then federal financed uh, and state financed. Uh, one problem with those triggers during the Great Recession was they had both a level and a growth component. So you triggered onto extended benefits both if your unemployment rate was above 6.5% and if it's uh, at least 10% higher than it was in either of the previous two years. Uh, that higher than it was in the previous two years became binding very quickly during a long recession. And uh, it meant that a lot of states started losing extended benefits in 2011-12. There was a temporary law passed that allowed them to look back for three years. Uh, but a very easy uh, change uh, if we're going to index more things uh, to triggers uh, would be to make them purely level-based and, and get rid of these growth components. I think we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. Hi, uh, I'm actually just curious to hear your th uh, general thoughts on tying the tax code to the business cycle. I usually hear this in the context of uh, the payroll tax, but really just what either of you thinks about that. So, you mean in like an automatic sense, yeah, or? Mm -hmm. Again, I'm just, I don't see how that would happen politically. So, you know, there was the making work pay um, tax credit in the Recovery Act, and then subsequent payroll tax holidays, which were even bigger. Um, but then there were other proposals to reduce payroll taxes that were rejected. So I just, I, I think, you know, making it automatic would be tough politically. Yeah, as an economic matter, uh, anything which makes uh, things more countercyclical is good. So that includes taxes, including federal taxes. Uh, the progressive income tax system does do this to some extent, because as people's incomes fall, uh, they slide down into lower tax brackets and then effectively lowers uh, their tax rates. That's not a, that goes in the right direction. It's not a huge uh, uh, effect. Uh, and it's not particularly well targeted, because a lot of the people whose incomes are sliding are people who are falling out of the $300,000 tax bracket and into the $200,000 tax bracket, and they don't have particularly high uh, uh, marginal propensities to consume. Uh, but if we can do it, any, anything that, that, that makes uh, fiscal policy more countercyclical automatically. Uh, how, how worried are you about um, the fact that it looks like we will have a less progressive tax system? going forward in terms of its effect on, on yeah, so again, the, the all right, So even what we have now is progressive, it's just not that progressive. And so we just don't get that much uh, uh, bang out of uh, this fact of people sliding down tax brackets. And again, it's not particularly well targeted. So again, if making our tax system less progressive would go in the wrong direction, uh, but I don't think it's the first order thing uh, of the list of things we should be worried about in terms of rolling back. Uh, safety net and, and automatic stabilizers. Other questions? Over here. Hi. Um, so with the 2016 election, it kind of seemed like on both sides, uh, the only safety net issue that came up was paid family leave. I was wondering if you had, either of you had had a chance to look at the Trump proposal, which um, was quite different and kind of used existing resources um, versus the Clinton proposal, which didn't really come up with a new dedicated revenue source, but came up with um, higher taxes on the wealthy. Um, and whether or not that or anything else to strengthen the safety net might come up maybe in the next two years or really more realistically over the next four years if 
Congress were to change hands while the presidency stays in the same party. I think Catherine's written the most about that, actually. <laughs> Didn't you have a column about this just recently? Uh, today, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, was, I was arguing that if Donald Trump really wants to unify the nation, he should start out, uh, if you, you know, he can keep all of, his policy prior, all of his policy promises, but he should start out with the ones that are actually popular amongst liberals, with, including paid family leave, or some version of paid family leave. Uh, rather than the red meat stuff for his base, which actually even most Republicans don't like, like mass deportation, uh, if you look at the poll numbers. Um, so if you look at Donald Trump's plan, it's only maternity leave, and it appears to only be for women who have physically given birth. So it would exclude uh, lots of categories of family caregivers, including fathers, adoptive parents, uh, people who are providing elder care, things like that. And he doesn't exactly explain how he pays for it. He just says that he would basically eliminate waste, fraud, and abuse in the UI system, which, yay, that would be great. <laughs> um, but it's, it's, he kind of punts on it. Oh, and of course, economic growth would also be the way we would pay for it. Um, Hillary Clinton's plan was, was basically about raising taxes on the wealthy. There are a lot of other off-the-shelf plans that piggyback on the UI system. Um, I don't know what version of, of any of this might pass, but there actually is a lot of popular support for some version of paid family leave, so I, I think it would be awesome if we could move in that direction uh, with or without uh, Democrats in power. Could I say something in response to the previous question, actually? Uh, you know, if you, if you thought that progressive taxation was a good thing as an automatic stabilizer and you thought that the states were actually moving in the wrong direction, getting away from that, um, and you were concerned about moral hazard, you could basically offer this fiscal assistance um, with the caveat that states reform their budgets generally. And so you could have them um, basically move away from sales tax, or move away from volatile sources of um, income, like income taxes. Um, that was one of the concerns with general revenue sharing, that states basically were um, relying too much on sales taxes and said that perhaps you were getting them to, um, to you were moving toward a more progressive system um, by having the money come from the feds instead of from the state level. Um, so there are ways that states basically could um, change their fiscal behavior to qualify for federal assistance, including investing in rainy day accounts and, and being ready for the next storm. Microphones. Oh, two microphones are coming. I'm wondering if you could address the issue of the difficulty the future administration would have in reopening closed factories, and would would there would do you, would you imagine the Congress might be receptive to the idea of more funds for relocation and retraining assistance? It would. It seems that would be a lot easier than reopening factories. And, and there might be some resistance uh, among people in those towns who have suffered a closed factor. They may not be able to move and may not easily move. I think that's a huge problem. There's this conflict between people and place-based assistance. And so um, I think there are political incentives to try to um, you know, help places like Detroit or New Orleans after Katrina. A lot of economists would say, or Ed Glazer, for example, and after Katrina basically said, wouldn't the residents of New Orleans be better off if you gave them each a voucher to relocate someplace else in the country? Other people have speculated about, you know, the economic growth is happening in certain very productive metros, and those are hard places to live, so if we could do something about housing regulations in those places or otherwise help people move into those areas, it would do a lot for overall economic growth. But as you mentioned, I mean, there's this concern you can't leave a place behind. And, and personally, you know, I, we did come to the aid of Detroit. Um, they expedited uh, flows of federal funds. Um, there were ways in which the Obama administration used its bully pulpit to try to help that area. Um, but I worry about the smaller towns um, that might not get as much um, political attention. Sort of what do we do for those places? We don't have a uniform policy in place. There are these um, promise zones um, which are built on the idea that we could sort of better coordinate existing dollars going to a place. Um, and see some sort of synergies there. But I think um, you know, the place-based stuff is hard, um, deciding sort of who gets helped and who doesn't get helped. And again, I'm not sure how much appetite there is for doing that in the new administration. And congressional support, can you comment on that? 
Exactly. So with the promise zones, there were um, $50 billion, I think, in tax incentives that were supposed to be attached to the promise zones that never got through Congress. Um, so part of the concern with that program is that there's no new money. It's just awarding people preferences in terms of getting existing federal grant dollars. My read of the recent academic literature on the play space is, I don't know if you were negative, it's a little bit more positive. Um, Pat Klein is an economist at Berkeley who's done some writing on this. and. and is more optimistic than the sort of earlier uh, literature mm -hmm. uh, that Ed Glazer was uh, sort of citing there. Um, but it's, it's just surely one of the harder problems uh, we have to face uh, is what you do uh, when geographic areas as a whole um, uh, uh, have negative shocks and, and face uh, uh, the need to readjust what they produce uh, and who lives there and maybe downsize. Uh, and, and even the success stories uh, in American history, places like Pittsburgh, uh, mm -hmm. which have really rebounded, um, went through some very tough times uh, to do so. I just want to be clear, I was not endorsing um, that position about New Orleans, um, but I'm, I'm not sure I trust our political system to adapt well-chosen place-based interventions. Well, thank you so much to our panelists, and thank you to the audience. Thank you. Thank you.